Howdy y'all and welcome back to Country Fried Minis. I'm your host Cameron, the country boy in the big city, presenting to you once again from the Bullshit Corner 2.0 and today I'd like to talk to y'all about making your models larger than life. For my personal larger than life mini today, I'm going to go ahead and size up your typical 6mm Battletech model into a 28mm scale Titan. And what model would be more appropriate than that hero of the community, that plucky little trash can, the Urban Mech. It's already larger than life, and we're going to make it truly larger than life. So sit back, relax, get you a cup of joe, don't mix it up with your paint water, and follow along and you can see how we turn one of Matt Mason's fabulous creations into a hulking gargantuan. First up, we need to go ahead and note that these pieces still have a little bit of resin gunk on the ends, as well as some little bumps left over from where the supports were attached. The initial step here is to remove that resin gunk with a little bit of this here 70% isopropyl alcohol. We'll pour up a little bit of this alcohol in a disposable shot glass and use a dedicated toothbrush to scrub off that resin. Meanwhile, it's a good idea to have a little piece of paper towel handy just in case you make a mess. And to get started, we won't need much of this alcohol, maybe about a half ounce or less. Just carefully pour out a bit, recap your alcohol, go ahead and grab your toothbrush, and then we can start. Shit. With our little reservoir of alcohol uh, safely off to the side, we can use this here dedicated toothbrush to go ahead and scrub away any remnants of that 3D print and resin. A little bit of diligence at this stage will help the later steps go a little smoother. It's worth noting that it's especially important to ensure that any portions of the model that have leftover marks from the 3D print supports need to have any and all sticky residue removed because from here we're going to use our trusty army painter file and start smoothing down these connection points. This is going to generate a whole lot of resin dust and it's important that we get rid of that dust rather than have it cling onto the surface of the parts. All that filing notwithstanding, we're still dealing with a little bit of warpage on these here models. It's pretty common when you're dealing with 3D prints that come from a cheaper resin printer and we can fix that with very little effort with the use of a power tool. In this case, I'm going to use my Dremel cordless rotary tool to make light of the work. And as you can see, this is going to generate a whole heckin' lot of dust. So, as if I've not said it enough, make sure you're wearing a respirator and don't be breathing this stuff in. The health risks of long-term exposure to fine particulate are very real, and you can save a whole lot of headache by simply protecting your breathing. Now if you thought that the grinding was generating a lot of dust, wait until you get a peek at the mess kicked up by this here cutting wheel. Somewhere early in this build process, I decided I wanted to do some interior lighting. So to access the interior of the upper torso, we're going to use the cutting wheel to create an opening with ample access space. And with that open, these rough edges simply won't do. So it's time to create an even more potent cloud of resin dust with my sanded drum. Now, with this scene here, 
I would absolutely be remiss if I didn't take yet another moment to reinforce how important a respirator is while working with this dust. It's simply not worth the risk to your well-being to not protect your breath. And continuing with the theme of power tool use, I'm going to get out my cordless power drill and a small bit so that I can remove the material from the cockpit canopy view screens, ensuring that I take my time so as to not crack the resin nor drill into my fingertips. Doing this while holding the piece can be a bit intimidating, but if you go slowly and precisely, you can avoid injuring yourself or damaging the model. And once the bulk of the material has been drilled out, I'll get out a triangular army painter file and finish smoothing out these openings, pausing at the end to get a measurement of the interior space for future additions. With that step complete, we'll switch back over to the rotary tool with cut and wheel and create an opening on the inside of the left leg's pelvic connection point. Unlike the earlier cutting, smoothing this out isn't super necessary, so we'll leave the rough edges and not bother with the sand and drum. However, we will swap to a conical grinder bit to open a channel through the waist connection point as well as to grind a hole in the bottom of the foot. <laughs> come, come on, oh, damn it. Okay, once opened up, we we'll use a round filer to smooth out the opening so we can pass a guide for the wiring on through. To achieve this, I've tied a little piece of paper clip onto a bit of string and I'll use this here neodymium magnet to assist in threading it through the complicated internal geometry of this here leg in motion. Once the wire guide is threaded, it's time to lock it in forever by gluing the two leg halves together. Though I'm using a surplus of glue to ensure a strong bond, care is taken to not get any of this sticky fixative onto the string, further facilitated by the use of accelerator to cure the glue instantly. And with that, we'll go ahead and swap over to a bit of green stuff and a sculpting tool to fill in the unsightly gaps made by the slightly warped pieces. This gap is quite sizable, but with some patience and effort, it'll be hidden in no time. Meanwhile, I've just finished printing out this here little urban mech inspired pilot, and I'll set it to cure up under my UV nail station while I move on to finishing up these legs. The green stuff has had a few hours to dry, and I'll get back out my flat army painter file to go ahead and help sand the surfaces flush and smooth. This step is also quite tedious and repetitive, but while I put in the effort, I'm going to go ahead and take the chance to introduce today's guest palette, Psyduck. With this little puddle of super glue, we can use a toothpick to apply it with precision to the model. In this case, I thought it would save some time to go ahead and attach this here small laser to the left half of our Urban Mex torso. Kind of funny to think of this as a small laser at this scale because the part here is anything but small. In fact, this little arm is as big as a whole mech in six millimeter scale. And now that we have that little pilot model all cured up and ready to go, we're gonna go ahead and give it a real rudimentary paint job and toss it inside this chassis. For this pilot, I've elected to go with the color scheme of Catalyst Games Urban Mech Pirate Plushie. As always, we're gonna start out with a Zenithal Prime using Style Res Black Primer and Liquitex White Ink. Since our pilot is going to be barely visible from the little windows of our cockpit canopy, the paint job on it isn't super important. To keep things simple, the paint is largely going to be contrast colors, allowing the translucent paints to do all the shading for us. We'll start with Imperial Fists for the arms, getting them done in a single coat at full strength. Moving on, we'll mix up some Warboss Green and Contrast Medium to tint the majority of the torso a nice desaturated green before moving on to the next color which will similarly be mixed with medium into a translucent coat. That tone in question is going to be Mephiston Red, which we'll use to color in the few off-color chest panels. There's not too much of this color, and although we're trying to get this step done as quickly as possible, we'll need to take some care to not stain up the previous color, as the red pigment is really strong comparably. Following that, we'll go ahead and use some Griff Charger Gray to shade up the hands. And now to tie everything together, we'll apply some Nuln Oil shade over the whole thing to serve as some bold recess coloration. Finally, we'll go back over some of the edges with the base colors in turn, noting that this model won't be very visible at the end and to not waste too much time here. First up is Warboss Green, focusing on the front edge of the upper chest and the top of the head. Next, we'll go for some Mephiston Red, 
applying a focused edge highlight to just the very top of the chest panel. Now it's time for a little bit of phalanx yellow for the shoulders, applied super sparingly. The color here is substantially lighter than Imperial Fist, so just a touch is needed. And finally, some golden brand carbon black for the antennae, blacking them out completely. In hindsight, I could have gone with a lighter gray, as these disappear entirely in the finished product. Anyhow, now we're going to attach this pilot to the interior space of the torso. First, taking a little bit of time to see what this little feller is going to look like through the cockpit view screens. Digressing, I've gone ahead and stuck this pilot in place with a small blob of green stuff, and now I'll lock it in place permanently with a surplus of super glue. The excess amount of this glue is to ensure that this dude gets stuck in position really firmly, despite only being glued in by one side of the command couch. With the pilot secure, it's time to prepare the interior lighting for this kit. I snagged several battery holders with built-in on-off switches some time back, and I thought this project would be the perfect application for one of them. These here switch boxes hold a pair of CR2032 flat watch batteries, and they last a really long time just powering a few micro LEDs. As a nod to the upcoming color scheme, I wanted the interior lighting to be red, so a quick dip into my Acrision N87 metallic red paint will work just fine to stain them the proper shape something kind of red, perhaps a bit pinkish. This paint is pretty translucent and dries extremely fast, so by the time we give the LED a quick secondary test, it's already ready to be applied to the model. Moving onward, it's time to enlist the help of Psyduck once again and dip the back side of our now red LED into its puddle of glue before applying it to the interior wall just above the view screen openings. We'll carefully thread the leads around the antennae and use a toothpick to bend them into the proper shape. This can be a bit of a fiddly process and we'll end up securing the lead with several dots of super glue along its length. Of course, owing to the lack of a pilot, the other side's light will be quite a bit easier to get secured in place. Now, using some tape to briefly hold the two halves of the torso together, I'll give each pair of leads a quick test to confirm that both sides are working, as well as take a moment to appreciate the red effect under the proper darkness level. With that successful test, it's time to get our Psyduck friend all sticky again. Our guest palette has been super invaluable today. Thanks Psyduck! Anyhow, using its reservoir of super glue, we'll go ahead and secure the two halves of the torso together. As you can see, We've got the same problem as the legs had, and these parts don't precisely line up. Since the gaps are a bit more substantial, and the deadline to complete this project is a bit short, this time around, I'll utilize a bunch of super glue in a gap filling capacity. For that, the super glue filler is built up in several layers, alternating between thin applications of the cyanoacrylate and then accelerator until the gaps are more or less fully filled. From here, it's back to a variety of files with which we'll go ahead and start sanding the surfaces as flush as is manageable. The flat file is perfect for the broad areas and the triangular one is necessary for tighter sections with some detailed surface topography. Of course, the super glue filler isn't perfect, so again a touch of green stuff is needed to perfect the cleanup. The green stuff is also perfect for the smaller, more easily managed gaps such as the one here near the shoulder connection. I'll apply thin sausages of the putty and use my sculpting tool to make some of the more intricate details match those on the surface. For example, these vents have detail that's easily obscured if we don't take a little extra care and match the crevices. Finally, we can use a bit of the putty to finish up gaps that weren't completely fixed by the glue filler. And with the tiny little Irby pilot sequestered away forever inside the chassis of his larger cousin, it's time to start thinking about priming these models up. First we're going to tape off the openings, and then we're going to get to work. As far as tape choice goes, I didn't have any masking or painter's tape on hand, so instead I've opted to use some of this here Scotch brand matte finish magic tape. I'm sure there's some reasons out there to not use this as a masking agent, but it's what I had and I'll use it to cover up the LED leads as well as the openings into the cockpit. If any of y'all out there know any reasons why this is a bad choice of tape, let me know in the comments down below. I could sure use your input. Anyways, I'll apply this tape as firm as I can and use this here crusty old hobby knife to slice away the bits I don't need, getting as close as I dare to the canopy openings and then peeling away the excess. 
Now, with both halves adequately masked off, it's time to hit it with a solid coat of the Steinal Res Black Primer before moving on to the Liquitex White Ink Zenithal Coat. I really enjoy spraying on Zenithal Coats these days. It just seems like a great way to bring out details when getting the project started. And speaking of enjoyment, if you're new here and you're enjoying what you see, why not drop us a subscribe by clicking on that button down below. Subscribers not only get to stay appraised of new content drops, but also get sneak peeks and workbench updates through our community page here at Country Fried Minis. Digressing, let's keep doing the YouTube content creator checklist thing and mention today's sponsor. Today's content has been brought to y'all by Aries Games and Miniatures. Hey y'all, I've got a real treat for you today. I want to tell you all about Aries Games and Minis, the best place to get your Battletech fix. At Aries, you'll never have to pay MSRP again. They always have the best prices on Battletech models and their selection is unbeatable. These folks are the go-to for all your Battletech needs and let me tell you, they've got a whole herd of models to choose from. And not just any old Battletech models, these are top of the line minis that'll make your opponents run and hide. Whether you're looking for those new era Catalyst Games box sets or feeling nostalgia for the older sculpts, Aries Games and Minis has got you covered. Plus, the selection of Iron Wind Metals models is absolutely a stampede of classic pewter designs, all of them accurate to the original technical readout artworks. And check out these blister packs. Each one is filled with all the metal you need to build your own army and conquer the battlefield. You can just hear the power, can't you? Now listen here, these blister packs are packed with metal, ready to take on any opponent on the battlefield. You can almost hear the guns blazing just by looking at them. The best part, Ares Games and Minis always sells their models at a discount so you can save some green while you gear up for battle. Now that's what I call a win-win situation. And if you're looking for something truly special, make sure to check out Ares' flagship model, the Ares. It's a real showstopper. But whether you're looking for the latest releases or something classic, Ares has you covered. And you know, I always say, why have a horse when you can have a battle mech? It's faster, stronger, and it's got more firepower. So if you're looking to set yourself up with your own slice of feudal warfare in the fourth millennium, head on over to Ares Games and Minis. And remember, when it comes to Battletech, you don't need a fast horse, you just need a fast mech. And make sure to tell them that Country Fried Mini sent you on over. Now that y'all have seen that ad and got a good look at both Ares Games logo and their flagship mech, the Ares, you've got a great idea of where the inspiration for today's color scheme has come from. To get started making this urban mech match the standard Ares paint job, we're going to spray a nice gradient out of the airbrush. The majority of the color scheme is blue, and for that I've chosen to start out with super thin coats of Calador Sky. We'll build up some color on specific panels, but ensure that it remains translucent to let the zenithal underpainting do some of the work for us. This paint is so thin that each coat dries really fast, but it's really easy to overdo it on each pass. For that, it takes some patience to make sure that we don't flood any areas. A surplus of this runny paint here could function like an ink wash or get some serious spider webbing from the airflow of our airbrush, and neither of these things are desirable. As we wrap up this color application, my favorite Liquitex white ink is added in dropwise to build up a gradient that accentuates the zenithal prime, still maintaining a thin and translucent application. After a few coats, it's looking mighty nice, and it falls on intuition to know when this step is done. Sometimes it's really hard to know when to stop, but remembering that old adage, less is more, really helps to pick the point to move on. Now that we've sprayed out that base blue tone, let's go ahead and bust out the brush and start laying forth this quartet of colors which will make this urban mech look just like the flagship model, the Ares. The most prevalent secondary color on this here paint scheme is going to be a dark charcoal-esque color. To mix it up, I'm going to start out with a little bit of Golden Brand Carbon Black and add just a touch of white ink to it. Not too much, mind you, as we want to keep this tone really dark. To thin out the paint and allow myself ample time to work with the tone, I'll go ahead and add a bit of my Winsor & Newton Fluid Retarder to it. I find that adding this to my paints when I have a large area to work on allows me to get the most of my laid out colors. The bigger models tend to take some time to get the brushwork done, and this very nearly doubles the drying time on my paints. Digressing, I've slowly added in a touch more white to build up a few layers of really sketchy edge highlighting. 
They don't need to be super precise as it'll get tamped down and blended in with the later wash steps. We'll continue building this tone up for a few layers, adding it in increasingly sparing amounts until we've achieved a reasonably reasonable highlighting pattern on the model. Each layer will focus more on just the upper edges of individual panels, with the final highlight being a mid-tone gray applied exclusively to the sharpest edges. To build up to that final highlight tone, I found that it was necessary to add several drops of the Liquitex white ink to achieve a noticeably bright edge highlight tone. Moving on, the third color in this scheme is a really bright gray tone. Not quite white, but very light. To easily achieve this tone, I've decided to use this here Ultha One Gray by Citadel. In hindsight, this color was a bit of a nightmare to work with, as it was really chalky and the pigment tended to settle out in clumps. Bad color, GW. And next up will be the Baylor Brown, picking out the spots that'll be yellow in the end. We're just gonna put on a base coat here and let it dry while we move on to the next color. This coat doesn't need to be super solid, as we'll be painting back over the majority of the brown color when we revisit these sections later on. To shade up the Ulthawan gray sections, I'm gonna go ahead and apply a bit of this here Griff Charger Gray straight from the pot. It's got a bit of a greenish gray hue and that'll add some really nice contrast to the other gray parts while also tying this tone into the color scheme as green is the midpoint of blue and yellow. And speaking of yellow, we're going to go ahead and revisit the Baylor Brown base coats and add a touch of phalanx yellow into the mix. Just as with the other tones today, I'll be adding in a bit of fluid retarder to slow the drying time and help with blending as I slowly add in yellow to the brown to get a color somewhere in between these two tones. Again, the highlights are done in a really sketchy fashion as we'll be putting on a wash later and that'll tie these layers together and hide any crimes in our paint application. With the yellow complete, we'll go back to the Ulthawan Gray and start building the color back up, using the previous contrast paint as a shadow layer. For this step, a mixture of straight brush application and dry brushing is used to create a bit of a textured appearance. We want to cover almost all of the contrast paint shading, leaving just a hint of that green gray underneath the bright gray tone. And finally, there's a few smudges that have found their way onto the blue. So we'll mix up a light blue color by combining Calador Sky and a touch of the white ink so we can touch up the problem spots. We'll need to work at this portion with super thin coats, striving to match the color as it was sprayed on originally. With a bit of patience and a back and forth action between lighter and darker blue highlight tones, we can get rid of those gnarly black thumbprints. And now that she's very nearly fully painted, save for a few little touch up spots, it's time to get out our super glue and accelerator and our solder and our soldering iron and put this model together and start making her a completed piece. To start getting this urban mech wired up, first we need to thread the wires through the leg of the model. I actually ended up having to redo this part with longer leads, but this here sequence is gonna illustrate the method. Using that string we ran through in an earlier step, we'll go ahead and tie it onto the end of these here wires. To ensure that it don't slip off while being pulled through, we'll need to ensure that the string is heading straight off the tip and then use some super glue and accelerator to lock it in place. Once we remove that tape that we applied before painting, we can slowly and gently pull these wires on through the leg using that string as a guide. It's really important to be careful here and not snap the string. With that first bit of preparation out of the way, it's time to start soldering. And before we begin, we'll remove the protective tape from the LED leads as well as from the opening into the torso. I'm extremely inexperienced at this, but I understand the idea on a practical and conceptual level. Though I've done this a few times before, I'm quite a klutz and tend to make a mess of just about everything I do. Now if I could just get these things to line up right. Oh crap. Damn it. That major blunder aside, the rest of the process went rather smoothly. Continuing on, and with some fiddling, I managed to get both pairs of LED leads soldered together and then attached to the battery wires. 
To make sure there wasn't any kind of short in the future, I decided to wrap the exposed connections with electrical tape, first individually and then as a completed bundle. With the wire secure and sealed in, it was time to go ahead and peel the mask off of the cockpit view screens and give a proper test to this lighting. As an aside here, I'm happy to report that my solder and iron is just fine. The wire didn't burn through the coating completely and I didn't have to do any kind of electric surgery. And I'm even happier to report that this here soldering job worked like a charm and the lighting works just fine and dandy inside the cockpit of this Urban Mech. Now we'll pull the wires taut so we can start gluing the two halves together. This is done with care so as to not damage the solder joints or pull the LEDs off of their mountings. For that, we'll first get our super useful friend Psyduck all sticky again. <laughs> Thanks bud. And then we'll use a toothpick to apply the adhesive with precision to the waist joint of the battle mech. A quick alignment and then a hefty spritz of accelerator ensures that this pose and the wires are secure. Next up, we need to secure this titanic construction to the base. I've got a round blank of birch wood to serve this purpose, and we need to get these wires through it. First, I'll mark the spot where the wires need to pass through, and then I'll get back out my cordless drill to create the opening underneath the Urban Mech's left foot. Once ready, we'll go ahead and thread the wires through the hole, pulling them taut with the same care taken earlier when joining the two halves. A hefty amount of super glue is applied directly to the feet, and then another spritz of accelerator cures that glue rock solid in an instant. After selecting some plastic doohickeys to use as feet, I'll go ahead and cut the wires down and carefully solder them to the battery leads. By this point, I've gotten a little more comfortable with the soldering process, and this went extremely smoothly. Once done and taped up, the battery pack is scuffed up a bit to increase the efficacy of the superglue adhesion, and then a hefty glop of the cyanoacrylate adhesive is applied before securing this battery pack to its permanent home on the bottom of this base, a spot where the power switch, as well as the battery door, can be easily accessed. Finally, we need to clean up the cockpit view screen supports, so a bit of Calidor Sky is applied with a few coats until the color is matched up nicely. This won't take no time at all, and from here we can move on to the final steps of this project. And now we're going to give her all those fun little details that make it look like a completed model, such as freehand details, sponge chipping, and rust effects. First up for these final details, we're going to freehand on the Ares logo onto the side of this here AC20 arm. Freehanded symbols isn't as hard as it would seem, and exploring this talent really just takes a patient approach. We're simply going to block in approximations of the colors on the logo at hand, and then slowly add lighter tones and blend them together. During this process, we're still using the Windsor & Newton Acrylic Fluid Retarder so that our paint stays wet for a longer time, and then we're adding tones together on the surface to use a bit of wet blending until they're smooth and the gradients are as desired. With the logo we're painting today kept nearby as a reference, this process is just one of patience and working back and forth until it starts to look right. It's important to use a nice sharp brush here so we can apply the details with precision, but there's no need to be intimidated by the process. Once we've got the logo almost perfect, we can use a bit of carbon black paint to draw on a nice thin border around the symbol. With the free hand and complete, now we're going to get out some burnt sienna and lamp black oil paints and pre-prepare for the oil washing step by putting these colors onto a scrap piece of cardboard. This will allow them to drain off as much linseed oil as possible to accelerate later drying time. Meanwhile, we'll return to the airbrushing booth with some Windsor & Newton Galleria Acrylic Gloss Varnish. By building up a nice shellac of shiny top coat on this model, the surface tension of the later upcoming oil wash will be further reduced. And now while we wait on the drying and draining, it's time to take a brief break.
Okay, break time over, we're going to get out some white spirits and get to work making up a grime wash. As you can see, our oil paints have drained out immensely while the gloss varnish was curing up and they're ready to be made into a dirty and agent. We're going to take a mixture of something like 65% burnt sienna and 35% lamp black oil paint and mix it up with a whole bunch of white spirit and then slop it over every square inch of the model. Then we're going to set up a 45 minute timer and let that nastiness dry out. It might look like we've ruined the model entirely, but fret not as this is all part of the process. Once it's had at least 45 minutes to cure up, we're going to go ahead and get out some fresh unsullied white spirits. Next we'll apply those white spirits to a bit of sponge and an old soft rag and start removing the majority of the grime effect. That dirty black brown color is going to stay in the recesses and give us some really nice ambient occlusion and simulated dirt buildup in the crevices. This effect has the added benefit of blending together all those rough, sketchy highlights that we've applied. If anything, the bold jabs with the brush that we used earlier will help these layers still remain visible after getting a little bit of that classic grimdark treatment. The next step of beautification is going to be paint chip effects. We'll start out with a bit of Vallejo's Whole Red and mix it with some black from the same brand. From here, we'll dip a shredded piece of sponge into that paint and remove almost all of the color until almost nothing comes off it. Then, it's just a matter of jabbing at the model in a semi-random way, focusing our attack more so on angular edges than flat areas. Of course, paint is usually done in layers, so we need to simulate that. To achieve this look, I'm choosing to use a bit of this here Folk Art Metallic Silver Sterling paint and carefully use a brush to apply this silver tone to the centers of large areas of the sponge chip. This second layer of color adds a tremendous amount of depth to this chip and effect. Finally, to bring out the dimensionality of this effect, we'll use some dirty down rust effect to add some corroded looking streaks streaming down from the worst spots of the chipping. And with that, this addition adds a look of heavy machinery to this massive model. Seriously, you gotta try this stuff if you ain't already. It truly lives up to the height. And now that all that painting is wrapped up, it's time to get out some of my favorite hobby products and finish up that base. Okay. My basing texture mix always begins with baking soda. This stuff has a really fine grit and looks properly in scale for miniatures at nearly any size. I'll go ahead and chuck a double tablespoon of this stuff into a disposable shot glass and then add a bit of basing grit to add some variety to the texture. Next up is a whole bunch of PVA glue and then I'll put in a bit of apple barrel antique gold paint as well as about twice as much Vallejo dark sand. Give it all a good mix, and then spread it all over that base in a super thick fashion, just like icing a cake. If this stuff gets a little too hard to spread, you can use a good medium sized brush with some plain distilled water and smooth it out as you see fit. While the base and gunk is still wet, we're going to go ahead and black out the rim with Golden Brand Carbon Black Paint and then add a variety of small bits of scale vegetation to the surface, remembering to be sparing since it's in a desert. After a few hours dry time, we're gonna once again visit the spray booth and this time apply multiple thin coats of this here Windsor & Newton Artist Acrylic Matte UV Varnish, completely removing any shine that's left over from the earlier gloss coat. I highly recommend this particular matte coat varnish as it removes all shine entirely and it can even be applied by hand if you don't have access to an airbrush. And for the final step today, we're going to need one last use of our guest palette, Psyduck. <laughs> it's going to hold on to some gloss Mod Podge for us. Thanks buddy. Here at the end and with the final brush stroke, we'll apply a little globule of this inexpensive glossing agent onto the lens of the small laser. Now that we're done, we'll let that dry and move on to a grand reveal.
And with that final reveal, y'all have seen the fruits of my labor for this week. I highly recommend getting outside of your own comfort zones and trying to paint your own model that's larger than life. Whether you're working on your own piece whose story and lore is bigger than its stature, or building your own titanic version of the same thing, you can have a lot of fun getting into this whole theme of larger than life. In the end, I made this project a little more ambitious than I had initially sought out to do, but it was a ton of fun in doing it, and I'm really glad to have this here finished piece. I'm not sure where it'll end up, probably somewhere on a shelf, or setting as a display piece in one of the local game stores. Hopefully, if they have me. In the end, I want to thank y'all for joining me today. Shout outs to all the community members who keep coming back and digesting these little bits of country fried wisdom. And if you're new here, consider dropping a like and a sub down below. I strive to get out content fairly regularly, and you can expect some interesting things to come out in the future here at Country Fried Minis. So I want to take the time to thank y'all for stopping by and watching what we have for you this week. And I also want to take the time to remind you to be happy while you're painting. Take it easy, fellas. See you around next time. You can fire everything is 16 and another 18. 40. And another 34 heat. 34 heat. Jesus. And on 10 double heat sinks. On 10 double heat sinks. <laughs> Everybody ran.